So my name is Nelmino Roberts. Uh, I'm a principal consultant, asset management, business advisory here in New York. I also lead the industry for the asset management advisory team. Um, I've got my colleague here, Sagar. Greetings, everyone. Uh, uh, Sagar, Sagar Kanchala, based out of uh, Toronto, Canada. Uh, I'm with the advisory services group with uh, WSP Canada, leading the energy transition and investments uh, group. Uh, back to you. Thank you, Sagar. All right, so today we're talking about asset management in the context of energy transition. Um, we are going to uh, go through uh, the agenda item quite briefly. So we're gonna talk about the need for change, um, the integrating ESG factors into asset management. Uh, we go through a multi-criteria asset framework for energy transition, a couple of case studies and some takeaways. So first and foremost, the need for change. And I think it just goes, be, goes without saying, um, you know, most of us in this call uh, will be quite aware of the need for change. I mean, 79% of total greenhouse gas emissions, according to the United Nations Office for Project Services, is coming from infrastructure, and in particular, uh, through energy, transport, and building sector, right? And according to the Forbes, uh, a fifth of world's largest companies are committed to net zero targets. So what does that mean? That means that the awareness is there, the regulatory support is there. I guess the biggest question here is the how, right? And that's what we are all trying to solve, or that seems to be the biggest conundrum. So today's webinar, we, we are going to go through um, how asset management plays a part in the energy transition and go through uh, some of the key um, sustainable development goals, the ones that are identified at the bottom, are the key ones that we'll talk about. And as you know, ISO and IAM, uh, uh, the Institute of Asset Management, have a strong desire and open commitment to um, helping organizations around the world in this transition process. So, so integrating ESG factors into asset management. Before I, I go through this, I just want to set the scene around asset management. We're not talking about maintaining assets here. We're talking about asset management as a holistic process, as a sustained value creation process, a management process. And what you see here is the asset management conceptual model from the IAM, which I'm sure many of you will be familiar with. As you can see, typically the organizational strategic plan at the highest level gets influenced by external factors, um, you know, for, for the purposes of this conversation here, you see customers, the legal investors and the commercial environment all influencing the organizational um, uh, plans at the highest level. So if you look at that uh, in the current state, in the, in the ESG, uh, you know, through an ESG lens, it's clear that governments around the world, um, state governments and all sorts of different lawmakers are all urging and putting up mandates requiring uh, zero emission goals and other initiatives that are favoring this energy transition, um, you know, uh, wave that we're looking at. And the private sector and the investors, there's a strong appetite, increasingly strong appetite around investing in green, investing in sustainable uh, projects and initiatives around the world. The green technology is rapidly advancing at the same time. Um, and so you can see how the external factors that typically affect the conceptual asset management model are in favor of the ESG transition that we are looking at uh, at this point in time. So again, to reinstate the, the, the key factor, the, the key point here, asset management is a holistic end-to-end -end management practice. 
you know, we're trying to extract value from my assets, you know, starting from the initial phases of identifying need, um, you know, whether you are designing, create, uh, or buying that particular uh, asset to operate, maintain phases right through to the disposal phase. Gone are the days where we said, okay, you know, ESG teams are good to have. Now these are must have. And we have to look at and filter every life cycle activity through an ESG lens from an end to end perspective. And this is where asset management comes hand in hand and how it's, you know, integrates with ESG teams. Um, what we'll do today is go through a couple of um, case studies and a couple of examples to show what we have done to help our clients and customers in this transition process. And we as consultants and trusted advisors, um, you know, it's a duty to be able to help our clients and the communities that we, 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 we work in and serve in to, to help in this transition process. So this example here is with a transit agency here in the US. Um, you know, we help them with their capital planning process. So a capital plan, five year capital plan includes capital activity across the whole enterprise, across a multimodal environment. Um, what we have done here is we have helped the agency to identify uh, projects that are adding value in the ESG space uh, from providing services to under, um, uh, you know, uh, you know underrepresented communities, uh, providing services that are environmentally sustainable. Um, so here you see the projects that couple of projects that I'm highlighting here around the, the bus transitioning, uh, the energy transitioning initiatives and the supporting garage transition to support uh, the electric fleet buses. So what we have done here is help the agency to identify the projects and then not only just um, put those projects into the capital plan, but help them prioritize these projects through various ESG criteria that we've developed. Um, by doing that, these projects get elevated into the position where they need to be in order to get funding and board approval. This example here is another, uh, another initiative where we are helping a Fortune 500 global tech firm transition um, from internal combustion engine uh, fleet to uh, EV fleet um, that captures over six, across six continents and over 10 countries and the challenges around the asset data currently non-existent or inconsistent in disparate databases, different businesses, operating models, different use cases and user personas and varying business requirements for fleet management tools and business requirements around what data is required. So these are some of the challenges that you will go through when you're looking at and, and supporting uh, various initiatives that add value in the, in the energy transition from an asset management perspective. At this point in time, I'd like to hand over to my colleague, Saga, where he will talk more about the asset investment decision making. Thank you. Thanks, sir, Nilvino. Uh, as you heard from him, uh, the asset management framework, let's uh, focus on one of the elements in the asset management framework that uh, many of you are familiar with. This relates to the, uh, the asset investment decision making. There is an increasing uncertainty in this energy transition world. Uh, uh, there are definitely various participants wondering how to make the decisions. For example, a natural gas operator uh, looking at uh, greening the natural gas network would like to understand how reliable are these assets if uh, he were to blend hydrogen and renewable natural gas uh, into the pipeline grid. Uh, similarly, uh, you could have a hydrocarbon asset owner uh, thinking about uh, it's, it's really a hard to a bit uh, sector that I'm working in, how can I justify some investments in carbon capture? 
currently the carbon capture technologies uh, are not necessarily commercially uh, viable. Then you have an, an infrastructure investor with significant dry powder looking to invest in the emerging technologies. He would like to understand uh, the technologies behind it, whether there would be any stranded asset risk. And then you, with an increased uh, electrification, and an electric grid operator could be thinking about, uh, oh, there's an increased electrification. That means I need to expand my grid. How can I get public support for rights of ways? So these are all the, the issues that various parts in the energy transitions need to figure out before they make any investment decisions. And what we have realized it is, uh, there were two things which were always coming to the top when it comes to uh, some of these investment decisions. The first one, what we saw is that really to understand the key business case, case stakeholders that you are trying to build the investment uh, business case. And the requirements of each of these stakeholders would be different. You need to really understand the needs of the policymakers. You need to understand the, the regulators involved, the investors involved, and eventually the customers involved as well. A good understanding of your stakeholders is a prerequisite uh, for any strong uh, business case. What we've seen is that by really understanding them, there are more questions leading to more questions that would help you refine your business case. And the second thing, what we have seen is uh, how do we look at different frameworks? We are always used to the discounted cash flow analysis for looking at investment decisions. And asset management frameworks uh, through the ISO 55000 has evolved into looking at cost, risk, and performance. But I think now the need has come for other factors to be included into the consideration as well. Uh, no longer it's adequate to just look at the financial performance. You need to understand the risk and, and you need to understand the technical aspects. But now you need to look at the other ESG factors as well. What is the environmental impact? Is it positive or negative from a specific investment decisions? What are the social implications, uh, the job creation, the contribution to the, to the GDP? And the strategic fit as well. How does it fit with the business I am in? Uh, is, is the industry sector um, evolving? Uh, now we're seeing more non-energy players, the traditional players uh, uh, coming into the energy transition world as well. What are the implications uh, on, from a regulator perspective on the rate payers as well? What we develop in our uh, evaluation of this business cases to complement the ISO 55000 is really a multi-criteria assessment framework where we look at the various factors that need to be considered and have some appropriate weights and then develop a business case uh, uh, so, so that it is evaluated on many dimensions as well. That's what we found out was very important when you're making any investment decisions. Let's uh, quickly look at uh, some of the uh, case studies that we have undertaken recently. This is an example of uh, uh, mining operations looking at uh, getting off uh, diesel for their energy consumption and moving towards more uh, uh, renewable power uh, consumptions. So in this case, uh, uh, the investment was in a wind and uh, a battery energy storage systems displacing uh, diesel power at mining operations. When we were engaged in this uh, particular uh, project, what we looked at is, is beyond the, the technical and the financial aspects. We incorporated uh, some of the carbon uh, costing into the analysis as well. Uh, this project was in Canada and, and many of you might be familiar. The carbon pricing is expected to go to $170 per uh, carbon ton in 2030. So we included those uh, those costs into the, into the financial analysis to build the business case. 
the next example is uh, this is for a project with World Bank where we helped uh, the uh, Colombian government uh, uh, developing a business case uh, for electromobility. And it, we looked at looking at, at, at regulation business and the technical challenges uh, on the power system. And to justify this investment, it was again beyond uh, the, the financials and even beyond the GHG uh, emissions as well. So what we found the key driver uh, for Colombia to move to ultramobility was really the uh, reduction in air pollution. So we incorporated into the analysis uh, the qualitative and quantitative aspects of, uh, of moving towards an ultramobility that reduces uh, pollution in some of the major cities in Colombia. And the last example I have here uh, relates to the, some of the emerging technologies. Uh, this is uh, for an hydrogen investments. Uh, there's significant number of uh, funding available now globally in many countries uh, for investments in hydrogen and other clean energy uh, uh, technologies. And what is required for in many of the applications is it's not necessarily the, the technical uh, uh, aspects or the financial aspects. What the application looks for is, what is the socioeconomic impact? What is the environment impact by making this investments? Uh, so we, we had to develop a very comprehensive uh, business case. Uh, it goes back to the framework I alluded earlier, where we looked at various factors uh, to, to develop a comprehensive business case uh, so that uh, the, 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 the funding agency is, is, is in a good position to evaluate these investments uh, on a holistic basis. Uh, in, in the short term, we just went through some, a few examples and Nilmar has uh, provided some context as well of how asset management, investment decision making needs to integrate ESG as well. And what we've seen in an experience uh, across the WSP is when you're looking at integrating ESG factors in the asset management, uh, there are some of these are the four things which we have seen continuously very important. It's really important to understand the, uh, the risk and opportunities from the investment. There's lots of uncertainty in the energy transition world now, and it is important to quantify uh, uh, monetize some of the risks and the opportunities exist uh, beyond the traditional uh, costs and revenues. Uh, I talked about the stakeholder engagement uh, and what is required is the stakeholder uh, engagement. Uh, while it is not just the external stakeholders, it is really important as well to have a multidisciplinary uh, project team who can understand and engage with the diverse uh, stakeholders. Uh, there needs to be a, a, a shared understanding with all involved. Uh, the terminologies and definitions need to be clearly understood. Uh, there are numerous definitions when it comes to a simple word like net zero could be uh, interpreted differently by different groups. Uh, for, so for any investment decision, it is really important to have some common definitions and, and have a shared understanding of the goals. Uh, finally, Information is really important, as you must have seen in any asset management frameworks, uh, information needs to come from reliable resources. But in, in, in the current world of energy transition, the process needs to be fl flexible so that as and when the new information comes in, uh, the frameworks uh, can adapt to this uh, uh, new information. Uh, with that, uh, a, a quick overview, uh, I would like to thank you for participating in this uh, webinar series. I just want to mention as well that uh, this is part of the WSP's asset management webinar series. And uh, we have a couple of them again coming, uh, coming up uh, in, in, in November and, and January and invite uh, all of you to uh, attend these uh, series, uh, webinar series as well. With that, uh, we'll, we'll take any questions uh, that you might have. Thank you, Sagar and Nilmino, for your presentation. So just uh, the housekeeping items again, uh, you can uh, log your questions in the question box on the GoToWebinar platform. And also the presentation is available to download in the handout box on the dashboard. I will start with the first question. You presented in your framework the various criteria 
or capital decisions. With the newer technology, there is significant uncertainty on the performance and cost. How do you factor in the uncertainty? Uh, thanks for the question. Uh, I, uh, I, that's that's really important to understand. I, I think in the framework we talked about the various factors need to be considered, uh, but the key element is uh, in, in all this thing when when in, in the energy transition world is especially relates to the uncertainty whether the technologies uh, will work will will perform as they're expected to be. Uh, would there be any cost overruns? Would there be any events? What we have done in our multi-criteria assessment is that we have something called the quantitative risk analysis. To the extent that we can uh, quantify and use some statistical tools, and it could be simple things as Monte Carlo simulation of understand the schedule risk, the event risk. Uh, event risk could be anything related to the technology and, and the cost over run, uh, run risk. Uh, we would incorporate those uh, risk analysis into our framework uh, so that we fully understand the uncertainty and that becomes part of the business case uh, development. Thank you. Can you provide an example of who you might include on a multidisciplinary project team? Yeah, I can uh, jump in there and I'm sure Saga, from your experience, you can also add to it. Um, so from my example, uh, you know, you know, from my experience, you, know, you you are looking at this through an asset management lens. Um, first and foremost, the asset manager is no longer has has the same skill sets or awareness as what we traditionally have in the past. So you want people who understand not just the assets, the technical side of things, and the asset management um, expertise. They also need to be able to understand the implications of the asset, the people, and you know the processes um, when you're looking at you know uh, uh, an energy transition here. Um, so you know if I understood the question correctly, you know you'd want to have uh, people who are you know involved in um, uh, you know be it subject matter experts in um, you know assets right um, you want to have people who understand economics you want to have people who understand planning and you want to have uh, people who are you know say stakeholders or end users as well as the the people who are going to be funding you right from a financial perspective so um, the the stakeholder engagement case that that we are all I guess comfortable with in the past the paradigm shifted now to include more people there so saga I don't know if you had anything to add in there. Yeah, I think you covered all the stakeholders uh, that's required, and it, it it really depends on the specificity of the of the project as well. For example, uh, the, the other uh, group that I uh, would uh, encourage uh, people to involve is depending on where the project is passing through and whether it's in the rights of ways or, or the societies that you are embarking, it's always good to involve uh, some of uh, the the indigenous communities relations group uh, uh, from your organization. Uh, I think it's, it's uh, it, it, uh, at the early stages of any of these projects. Thank you. Uh, the next question is, do you think rules around carbon accounting are necessary or is the transition more about a, a strategic shift? If I can take that, uh, it's a combination of both. Uh, I, 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 it is a strategic shift that needs to happen as we uh, hearing all these uh, COP26 discussions, there is significant interest from a strategic perspective. But at the same time, standards need to be created across. It's not just about the accounting side or the technology standards. Uh, the earlier we we have some commonalities across the globe in terms of uh, 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 standards and that that is applicable even for carbon accounting as well uh, we should have rules established that are easily under, understandable uh, and as well as implementable uh, and and it's more important is they should be enforced as well thank you uh, the next question is, have you found any difficulties aligning asset management and ESD, ESG practices? And were there any uh, areas that align better than other? 
I'll take that one. Um, that's a great question, actually. And uh, again, you know, it's, it's sort of case by case basis and where, what industry sector that, that you're playing in, right? So, for instance, if you're looking at transportation, um, you know, the end goal of transportation is to be able to provide, you know, safe, efficient transport systems to people to take them from A to B, right? Now, when you apply the ESG principles, especially the equity side of things, um, it really aligns well because you kind of look at, you know, underserved communities, communities where they haven't had a lot of, you know, transport options in the past or cost-effective transport options in the past. So that type of, you know, alignment is, is quite easy. Um, also, what, uh, you know, we're seeing is that around the energy. So, for example, you know, you want to use sustainable energy options in transportation seems to be a very, very, you know, prominent, uh, um, I guess, use case, right? So right around the world, there's, um, yeah, you know, initiatives going around the bus, you know, going from diesel to electric buses or to, you know, trials around in hydrogen, et cetera. So I think those two things are very um, prominent in that industry. And it also is prominent in other industries, such as resource industries, mining, oil and gas. So I believe, you know, if you look at it through the that that type of lens, um, and the, the most important factor right now is because the external climate, the external factors are really aligned to this transition. So uh, I believe overall it's a, it's a good time, if that makes sense. Thank you. I will take the last question. Um, how can we accelerate the transition for electrification in transport like buses and rail when we have significant older technology? This is actually a question came coming from Australia, from the energy sector. Right. So I could, um, you know, add some thoughts around that. So the, the questions around how can we accelerate the transition for electrification transport? Absolutely. Um, so, uh, you know, sort of going back to uh, some of the things I was saying, you know, so we look at, we, you know, we look at the, the value, for, you know, the return on investment, but the investment here is the value created in the ESG space. So um, I can give you an example here that we have uh, buses compared to rail, for instance, the buses uh, in this particular uh, example was providing more uh, transport options to underserved communities, communities you know which which needed attention, so to speak, um, and the first responders. Um, so it was more uh, beneficial, and from an asset perspective, as well as infrastructure cost perspective, it was better for us to prioritize buses compared to rail. Um, but in some other instances. For, you know, for example, uh, I'm sure other modes of transport might be favored. Favored. So I think it's a case by case basis. But you still have to go back to, you know, you, you know, to the start, looking at what are you trying to provide and how do you want to optimize that, which should be the the, the biggest sustained value. Is that fantastic? Thank you, uh, Sagar. Do, would you like to add to to this? Yeah, just to add it, it is to accelerate the electrification. I think what's really required is strengthening the grid, right? I think it goes back to the earlier example as well. As uh, Nil Minot talked about the various modes of transportation, which is important that we evolve. Uh, but it is really important to uh, have all the stakeholders involved in the value chain from utilities to uh, EV charger. Uh, equipment manufacturers and all the way to end users uh, to to understand uh, uh, and appreciate the investment that's required in the grid. Fantastic, thank you. So we're at the end of our webinar session. Apologies for the technical issue on my end. Uh, please feel free to follow up directly with Sagar and Neil Minow via the contact details shown on the screen. And I would like to thank all attendees for joining today. Thank you very much for your time. I will wrap up the webinar now. Thank you. Thank you.